Hey everybody, great to see y'all, and thank you so much for being here, and welcome to everybody that's watching by the live stream. We're going to have a lot of fun today as Amber and I talk about a topic that um, is personal to us, and I believe will be personal to all of you. So we are in the third week of our series, The Light of the World, and it will conclude next week on the 26th, the day after Christmas. And today we're going to be talking about the imitation light. The imitation light. Yes, we will be. <laughs> so we are mentioning a lot about Satan, and we, I don't personally like to talk about him much or give him much credit, but this is more about exposing him for all that he is and focusing on the truth. So we're going to start off with John 8, 12. It says, Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. I love that because um, it's as simple as following him. But I really like the passion translation and I like the passion about it. So I know there's a lot of haters, but we're going to we're going to use this. Um, <laughs> Then Jesus said, I am light to the world, and those who embrace me will experience life-giving light, and they will never walk in darkness. I like that it's life-giving because that, to me, is the telltale sign as if you're believing the lies, if you're walking in darkness, there won't be any life-giving experiences in your life. It's, he, the enemy only knows how to produce death. So that's the main distinguishing thing we're going to be talking about. But he has, from the garden, always been a deceiver. He's always imitated. Um, and then in Second Corinthians, it even says Satan himself transforms into an angel of light. And I don't know if you know, but the word Lucifer actually means morning star. And Jesus is also referred to as the morning star in the Bible. And so a lot of times people are like, why are they both called that? Well, there's a big difference. Jesus is, um, well, Satan is the fallen star, and he represents the long, dark night of suffering on the earth. And Christ is not only the true lasting light of morning, but he was the first light. And he represents the great promise and hope. So when we think about the devil as an angel of light, you need to realize that he transforms himself, which literally means he masquerades himself. It means to hide or conceal your true nature or your true identity. That's why nothing grows in the dark. And anything that hides or isolates is often demonic or deceptive. And the devil is a master at hiding. And the devil's a master at getting us to hide. Right? So... There's a lot of ways that he does that, and we're going to talk more about that, but think a false show or pretense. Think the wearing of a disguise. Think being passed off as something else. The identity's concealed, and the true person and the true nature is unrecognizable. That's how Satan appeared to Eve and how Satan deceived Eve. So the devil doesn't just come right out like, hey, here I am, the devil. Instead, he comes in lots of different ways and even through other people circumstances, situations, and he comes in a way that gets you to believe a lie. He's the great deceiver. If Satan, the prince of darkness, can disguise himself as an angel of light, then so can his servants. They're called ministers of evil, and they disguise themselves as ministers of righteousness. Satan's main tool is deception. So 2 Timothy 3.13, in fact, all of 2 Timothy 3 is amazing. I taught on this last Wednesday night about how people can have a form of godliness, but they actually deny the power. And so they look godly, but they have no power. And they're actually deceptive. And so they have all, there's a whole list in 2 Timothy chapter 3. It starts out within these last days, extremely perilous times are going to come. The most perilous thing is people that appear to be true and real, but behind that is deception. And they appear to be godly. They appear to bring hope and life. But really what they do is they weigh you down with guilt and shame and lies and never feeling like you're going to measure up. And so 2 Timothy 3.13 uh, says that evil men and imposters will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And then in the scripture where we have uh, Paul talking about Satan appearing as an angel of light in 2 Corinthians 11.14 the next one in verse 15 says, 
It's no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves in the ministers of righteousness whose end will be according to their works. So I just want to briefly touch on this and we're going to talk about it more in just a moment. Religion is such a deceptive lie. It makes you feel good and it makes you think you're good and people even preach righteousness, but they're deceivers. You're made righteous because of who you are in Christ. And if people are preaching measuring up and performing and you're not doing enough or it's your fault that you're in this crisis or it's your fault that you're not healed, that's classic minister of righteousness teaching. Is we don't get any extra credit because we showed up at church today, right? What, what must happen is we have to put into action what Christ has put inside of us and become more like him. That's the key. Instead of becoming more religious or performing more or doing better. And we think that just because we came to church or we posted that thing or we listened to this podcast. None of those things actually transform us. It's Christ's life inside of us that makes us righteous and causes us to be sanctified and live the way that he wants us to live. So the devil is a master at trying to put things in front of you to make you feel good or to think they're going to heal you or bring life to you. It's an angel of light. And in turn, people come used by the enemy to try to appear as godly or to help you, but really they have a selfish ambition. They have a deceptive intent behind them. And that's why you have to be discerning. You have to have the Holy Spirit to lead you and guide you or you're never gonna be able to see it. And in the last days, people are gonna become incredibly deceived and they're gonna deceive others. And they're gonna look like they're men and women of God, but they're not. And so you have to be able to discern the difference and realize imitation is a fake. You know, when I think about imitation, I think about imitation crab, right? Like I love sushi, but if it has imitation crab, I'm never ordering it because I know what's in imitation crab. Uh, If you've ever researched it, don't, if you like imitation crab, don't research it because you'll never eat it again, right? I'm like, I grew up in South Florida, lived here for 16 years. I like real crab. The problem is real crab's really expensive and it's costly. But real crab is way more nutritious for you than imitation crab is. Just do the research on it. It's crushed up fish flesh is what it is with a lot of fillers and water and additives to make it stick together and bind together. Okay, we'll move on from that. You know what else I think about imitation? Milli Vanilli. Is that in your time frame? You don't know who Milli Vanilli? Like, were you girl, in- you know it's true. <laughs> Wait, it's, it goes like this. Girl, you know it's, girl, you know it's, girl, you know it's, rush off the stage. Some of you don't even know what I'm talking about. No, I don't. I know they were living- Late 80s, in 1990, they won a Grammy, put out, girl, you know it's too, blame it on the rain. They were in front of 80,000 people in Cincinnati when their lip syncing track uh, stop and kept repeating. They freaked out and ran off the stage. In fact, their Grammy was revoked because they never actually sang any of the songs on their album. Classic imitation, duped with a lie. And so the devil always from counterfeit art to counterfeit music to counterfeit food and especially to counterfeit faith or counterfeit religion, causing you to think that you're good when you're not. And the sooner we can all realize, I can't be good. I can do good, but I'm never going to be good. You can only be spiritual, which causes you then to do good, right? Classic deceptive imitation light. Yes. (laughs) I did not know that. Girl, you know it's true. (laughs) You're going to have that song in your head all day long. What was true, though? The truth, what was true was that there were other singers that sang no, their music. Like in that song. Like, what's, oh, we don't want to talk about that. That's not appropriate for... Well, I'm glad I got that education. I did not know that about Millie. Millie Vanilli, that's right. All right. Back to Satan. Um, so... <laughs> Oh, and I was thinking when you were talking, it's like, it's never the real deal. Like imitation is never real and the Satan real. can never be God. And that brings okay. me to the, 
what I was going to say about him is that he was cast out of heaven. We all know that. But why was he cast out? Like, why did he, why did he fall? In Isaiah 14, 12 through 15, it says, <coughs> How you are fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn. How you are cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. And Ezekiel 28, 17 says, Your heart became proud on account of your beauty, and your, you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. So I threw you to the earth. I made a spectacle of you before kings. So ultimately, it was his pride of him thinking in his own beauty and splendor and wisdom that he could be greater than, or that he should be greater than God. And so, which is ultimately his own deception. And now he lives the rest of his eternity trying to deceive people nonstop. To believe the same thing. To believe the same thing, that they could be above God. And that's really, I mean, we've all heard the message about the garden. That's really like she had it so great. She had the best of the best. She had intimacy with the father. And then he comes with the lie of like, there's still more. This isn't all. You, you could be, be like God. Yeah, you could be like him. And what, let me just say one of the greatest deception is rejection of God. Because in your rejection, you're actually saying, I'm better because I don't need him. I don't need or him. Or he's which not is real. Pride. And so um, we often find ourselves in darkness. Right now, there's a lot of people feeling like they're in darkness. I have some areas in my life that feel pretty dark. So, and it's a normal part of life. Like it's, it's normal to have these dark seasons, which are really just circumstantial seasons, like where things are just negative. I just told David last night, like, man, does it ever get to be just good? Like everything's good. Nope, it's always mixed. It's always like this area of life is so amazing. This sucks. <laughs> Let's just keep focusing on this, but this really sucks over here. Like, and so, like, it's all, we were talking last night, it's all in perspective. It's all in perspective. It's all in perspective. Like, hey, this really is not enjoyable. Everything about it is hard. And if I kept focusing on that one area of my life, it will end up making all the other areas that are really so blessed and great look dark as well. And then you're completely surrounded in a pit. And that's how the devil wants to keep you, in a pit of darkness, unable to see all the Lord's blessings. Because we were just talking about it, like he's still so good. He's still so good, even when I don't understand something's taking way too long and things are just really hard and it can just feel like, such despair, like you could just want to stay there in that despair and focus on the one negative. And that's what the enemy wants you to do is stay on the negative. Your situation may not be good, but God is good. Right. In every situation. Mm -hmm. And if you can see the goodness of God, you'll actually see it the way he sees it. And then he comes in the midst of that time in that hard place to show you that he's always there, he's always fighting for you, and it's always going to turn out for your good. So again, it all comes down to perspective, seeing it your way versus seeing it his way. And it's really just so black and white. Satan is the father of lies. God is the father of truth. And truth sets us free. So what we're going to focus on is what is the imitation, which is a lie, which is an alternative to the truth. If we choose the alternative to live our life, then we live in that imitation light, the not the true authentic light that's going to set us free. And I was just thinking in worship, like, man, I want to run my race well. Like, I don't want to walk slowly in darkness. I want to run my race well, meaning I can't have any bondage on me. I can't have anything like keeping me down or weights. Like I can't run well if I keep having, allowing the darkness to win, even for a day. And so I was just having that thought and thought I'd share it with you. But it's the one thing where we have, what do I have? I came up with a lot of things that, <laughs> eight things that really show that you have chosen in this area of your life to go for the imitation light, to believe the lie. And the number one thing would be pride. Pride is something that God resists. He resists you when you're proud, when you think you don't need him, when you think you're better, when you think you can figure it all out in your own strength then he resists you, honestly. Um, and then he gives so much grace to the humble. And so if you're humble, humble can look like a lot of things, but I see it as 
Lord, I can't do this on my own. You're in charge of my life. I'm giving you full authority of my life. And please, let's do this together. And that's really what grace is, is coming along together with him and, and allowing him to empower you to get through life. But another aspect of not being humble is something the Lord showed me in worship at the first service is there's this unforgiving spirit. When you're unforgiving, it comes along with pride because you're better than them. You, they don't deserve your forgiveness or they, you're justified in your anger. So I felt like the Lord told me, you've got to forgive this person in worship, the first service, which I didn't think I had any unforgiveness. That's basic Christianity 101. Yeah. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, I think I have. But then I'm thinking, like, no, they still drive the living heck out of me. Like, I, I don't think I have forgiven them. Nope. I know I haven't. So, like, I had to go through the process. Like, okay, I forgive them. I don't accept what they did, but I do forgive them. And it comes down to being humble. Like, I don't know it all. I don't have to be the right one to judge. I'm not the judge. So I'm going to humble myself and just forgive and love like the Lord does. And that's when his grace is multiplied. So the number one thing we can fall into is pride, in my opinion. Next would be self-sufficiency, which I feel like goes hand in hand with pride. And self-sufficiency is the exact opposite of grace. It's, I've got this, it reveals actually your lack of knowing perfect love. If you knew the Father's love you would not fall into self-sufficiency because you know he has good things for you and you don't have to do it all on your own. Um, and so grace is, I love you. I'm here for you. Let's do this together. That's what God's saying to you all the time. He wants you to tap into that grace and not carry the weight of figuring things out or solving things all of the time. Another thing we can do is we can check out or numb out. This is the funny part because every time he talks about this num num hotel, whatever, he talks about like people that numb out go to ladies' night or they go, which is that a thing still? Like, I don't understand. So, ladies' night. This was night back or, in the day in the. Or there was a disco or. 80s and 90s, that's right. <laughs> he really talks about a disco, like, he really does. Or, you know, the lights that you, was raves and all well, Back then, it was all about staying alive. Stay, oh, wow. Come on, Jeremy, you got to like that one. <laughs> uh, anyways, his example of numbing out and when people fall into, like, backsliding or sin or whatever is always drugs, drunkenness, and all kinds of weird names for drugs on top of that, or hooking, hooking up with people. But I'm here to say it doesn't always have to look that way. I have numbed out many times, and none of those things are on my list. <laughs> none of them. Not one. So I just want to represent the other half of the church. <laughs> we can all numb out in other ways, like television. Doesn't that sound so pure to you? Television, just watching TV too much. Not anymore. I know what's on now TV. Now you know, yeah. Um, so just vegging out, watching, and it's fine to watch a movie every now. And then. That's not what. Don't hear that. I'm just saying you're vegging out from reality. You don't want to deal with yourself. You don't want to be in silence. You don't want to deal with your stuff. Well, you used to veg out on Grey's Anatomy yes, all the time. That was your ago, thing. And but God set you free. Yes, He did because that show is crazy bad. Um, but back in the day, I used to like that show, and then slowly I felt convicted because it got crazier and crazier. Like, the storyline just got so wrong. Plus, it was imitation. It wasn't even real. Well, the agenda behind it was all. Yeah. Anyway, so I don't even watch TV anymore because it all just frustrates me for the half of it. So, but that's beside the point. Unless it's Fixer Upper. I, I like, uh, yes, that's the name. Good job. That's the name. I like uh, documentaries, like real life stories, things that I can learn from that are valuable. So that's a side note. Anyway, you can check out in ways like you can shop too much. You can be on social media. You can have uh, wine every night and not get drunk, but it's just more of a check out. Feel good, feel relaxed every single day. I'm convinced Amazon is the devil. I can just Amazon. tell you right now. I'm 100% sure. I feel like there's a lot of... Sean shows up at my doorstep every day. Is that his name? Amazon. Oh, I thought you said no. Sean. No, Amazon. You know his name? Were you... <laughs> you surprised me because he's always talking to the mailman. 
Oh. <laughs> I thought you met the Amazon guy. I'm out there praying for the guy, and I'm like, oh, God. I'm telling him, don't bring them anymore. Don't bring the packages. Don't even drive by my house, so you're going to get... No. <laughs> So anyway, one way you could fall into deception is just checking out in whatever way you decide to check out. Um, the, another one is religion. He talked a lot about this. It's measuring up. For me, it was years of thinking, like, I'm good with God. You, you, we've all heard that. Like, I'm good with God because I've came to church. I'm doing the right things. I'm a nice person. And you seem to think that doing the right thing. For all of my life, the Lord let me believe this. For most of my life, I don't understand why he tricked me like this. But I believed that if I did all the right things, then it would equate to like a really great ending. And, and, and it's not saying you shouldn't do right things. But then I finally figured out that even when you do all the right things, sometimes circumstances are really just bad. And bad things really just happen to you and you don't deserve them. You can't always secure the outcome. And I used to believe I... I in my works, could secure a positive outcome for my life. And you can never secure an outcome. What you can secure is that no matter what, God will be with you in the hard times. So that's one, one thing. That's how I see religion is uh, measuring up, doing all the things. God will be more happy with me if I do this. Um, then there's being double-minded, which really comes down to just being not believing that he's truly good. Like I had uh, multiple episodes in the last few years of rough, rough seasons. And I found out what it really revealed to me is like in a certain area, like for me, it was healing. I've shared that with you. I didn't all deep down believe he was good in that area or I could trust him in that area. So I was double minded for years and didn't know it. So it doesn't have to be like, oh, I'm at the club this week and I'm here. I mean, it doesn't have to look like that. It's that you don't believe his goodness in every area of your life. That's double-mindedness. Um, and then there's victim mode. I see this a lot in church or working with people all these years is when you're in a bad circumstance, it's easy to fall into victim mode, into poor me. And it's not saying you can't grieve and have hard seasons and be an emotional wreck because I've been there, but a victim mode that turns bad, <laughs> well, it's never good to be a victim, but um, is when you start filling yourself, you, you get filled with shame and then shame always blames. And what I see on this side of, of being a ministry is blaming us or blaming others in church that just weren't there for you enough. Like nobody's ever going to do enough for you when you're in the blame game, when you're in the victim mode. So the enemy would love for you to stay in that place of, well, it's their fault. I'm like this or they They're didn't do enough. Christians, They're, would they call themselves pastors? They call themselves ministers because, but they weren't there for this, this, and this. And it's everybody else's duty to make you happy. And it's not. And that's the lie the enemy would have you believe because ultimately you have to find your fulfillment in him. No one's ever going to measure up, ever. Like, I'm already going to fail you. I've already failed you. I will continue to feel like I cannot be everything to everybody. Um, and then there's number seven, the worldly perspective over eternal. Um, that's a big one because if we're only thinking about making our life here good and this only this life counts and we're not talking about everything we're doing counting for eternity, then we are going to set ourselves up for disappointment our entire lives because this isn't our final home it's never going to be comfortable it's never going to be the best you've ever thought god didn't promise you like a good comfortable pain-free life he promised to be with you in it all and we have eternity to look forward to so we've got to think that way we can't think so temporary um, and that's what the enemy would want you to do. Think about yourself. Think about your self-gain. Think about your week, your schedule, your little your thing, and not think about the big picture, which the Lord, his perspective is big picture all the time. And last, you stop growing. You just become stagnant. You stop being fruitful. Uh, the tree of life is full of life producing fruit, but you become just 
non-producing. You just are, the, the devil would love for you just to continue to waste time here on earth. We have so much to do. We cannot afford to waste any more time. Let me just say real quick, um, in the context of this uh, measuring up, I'm good thing, and the whole minister of righteousness thing, it's so incredibly deceptive because it actually makes you feel good and it makes you think you're in a good spot. And this is the greatest ploy of the enemy. And on the flip side, the devil also lies to get you to feel like you're never okay. And at some point, you're going to realize that God's with you right in the midst of your struggle. You know, there's people that they're always looking for the next deliverance, always looking for the next conference, always looking for the next church service, always looking for the next podcast, the next book, the next, and to get something tomorrow that God's already given you today. Because when you're born again and you give your life to Christ, you have all of him in you right now. Now you have to discover that, but this minister of righteousness thing puts a weight on you that often pushes people away from God ultimately, or pushes people away from one another. And it's a real disdain. Like, have you ever met people that are ultra religious and can quote a lot of scriptures and you just don't want to spend any time with them? It's like, you just don't like them. You know, and they're super hyper religious and they are super condemning or judgmental and they're always trying to fix you. And I realized a long time ago, I, I can't fix you. Jesus fixes people. And it's love that transforms them. Love covers a multitude of sins. So I can tell in about a whole 35 seconds when I'm talking to somebody what they're trying to pr- bring on to me. Is it condemnation? Ministers of righteousness always produce condemnation because you're never going to be good enough or measure up enough. And that's why whenever I'm helping somebody out of their struggles, the first thing that I want to show people is who they really are in their identity as sons and daughters in Christ. And so don't fall prey to that religious deceptive lie anymore and make sure you're not being that minister of righteousness. Make sure you're not that person. You can quote a lot of scripture, you can fix a lot of people, you can correct a lot of stuff, and you're super hyper-religious and quoting scripture all the time, and yet nobody likes you. I'm just saying, like, I'm not saying it's any of you. I'm just telling you, it's, a, it's not a joy. It's not the Father's heart, and it's not who he wants you to be. So all of... All of those things are just ways we can fall into deception, which is really just looking to the wrong light, to not the true light of truth. And so we can't always control our circumstances. We all know that, but we can control our response. And um, we've, got to tr- we've got to choose truth and fight for it. It's a fight to choose truth. You talk about how you had to choose truth last year. Yes. Okay. Um, so in the first service, I shared this, and I think I've shared this story before, but I believe it was last year, I got into a, a, I don't even know, I couldn't, all of a sudden, I just couldn't breathe, like I physically couldn't breathe, and if you don't know, whenever I was little, I struggled my entire childhood to breathe, and I was on all kinds of medicine, and I had severe asthma to where I almost died numerous times. I was rushed to the hospital, and in fact, every Christmas I was in the hospital because it took a while for my parents to realize I was severely allergic to the Christmas tree. Um, so it was just different, Then there was a lot they didn't know about asthma, and I struggled a lot. So then... I, I didn't realize I had this fear. I thought I had dealt with fear and anxiety or it, and all of that. But like all of a sudden when you just can't get a full breath and you're struggling, like to, you're gasping for air, it's a very scary feeling. And so it triggered anxiety every time I couldn't breathe. And then we, if you know anything about anxiety, it like triples the whole not being able to breathe. So <laughs> it was like... I just went went for six months struggling, going from doctor to doctor to try to figure out what was wrong with me and had to get on all kinds of asthma medicine. And I had to fight that thought of like, I thought you healed me, Lord. 
And I really like went, you know, 10 years without any struggles of asthma. So I really thought I was healed. And then it comes back and it seems worse than I've ever dealt with. And let alone there was all these COVID stuff happening at the same time. So I had all of that in my mind of that. It could be a COVID thing. And anyway, I ended up get having a sinus surgery and all kinds of stuff. And I eventually got past it. But it, I really, in that time, I really didn't think I would. Like the enemy, the lie of the enemy was, you're never going to be able to fly anywhere again. You should never drive your kids alone because you're going to stop breathing. Because there were numerous times that I would be driving them and I had to turn around because I couldn't breathe. And I thought I would just like wreck the car. There were many times I came to church, I couldn't breathe. I had to leave out of the sanctuary because I couldn't breathe. Um, And I went into panic. So it happened to me. It can happen to you. I was in major fear of death. And that's what I realized the root of it was, is that I was ultimately afraid of dying. And I am no longer afraid of dying. And it took that six months of struggling and realizing ultimately I came to the point of like, Lord, if you want me to go, then I'll go. It's up to you. My life is in your hands. And I'm no longer going to allow this to make my life death. I'm not dead. I'm going to live. And until I die, I'm going to live fully, no matter what the struggle is. And it was like I still had this lingering breathing problems for a long time, but there wasn't that anxiety that came with it. And so I was finally able to get past it. Six whole months of darkness and of feeling like I couldn't do anything. And some of the things that I did to survive were, I remember like having, like, because he would eventually go to sleep, because it was like when at some point he can't stay up with me while I'm trying to breathe because it was like six months of it. So he would pray for me, encourage me, and then he'd be off. And then I would be, and you all know the nights are the worst. The nights are the worst when you have fear. So I would go into full-blown panic at night and I'd be praying in tongues. I'd be listening to worship. And so I, all I could do to survive, it felt like, was to put worship on my phone and set it on my chest and just fall asleep to worship. And just beg the Lord to either, to just come, to come near. I wanted to feel him. That's all I wanted. Like, I just, if you're here, then I'll be fine. And another time, I remember just, I just remember the whole six months just pursuing the Lord with everything in me. The opposite of what most people would do. And that's what the enemy would want you to do. Like, hey, this is hard. You should curse God. You should, you should isolate. You should stop trying so hard. Don't go to church. It's easier to stay home. Don't push yourself to take your kids somewhere. Don't believe that the Lord's going to be there for you. Just isolate and sit still and don't do anything. Just be unfruitful. But I insisted I was going to push. I kept pushing and pushing and pushing. Coming every Sunday, like, I don't care if I can't breathe. The Lord's going to meet me there. And he did every time. So I remember just always seeking like times to go worship. And I would go into my room and just raise my hands and cry out. And just constantly just praise him and praise him that I was going to get through it. And ask him to show himself to me and to help me feel his presence. And that's the only thing that got me through. And then it was like all of a sudden I could breathe after six months. Can't figure out what it was. Don't know what triggered it. I live on a farm. I have no idea. (laughs) Like there's only a a million things that could have triggered it. But all I know is it lifted. And even now, like if I have a feeling, because the enemy doesn't ever stop, I have a feeling every now and then where I can't get a breath. And in that second, I have a choice to say, oh, here it is again. Oh, here it is again. I'm going to, I can't breathe. But in that split second, I say, nope. I'm fine. I'm going to breathe. I just pause. I get myself calm. And then I take my breath and I'm like, I'm fine. The Lord's not done with me yet. And that's what I say. And I move on and it, and it doesn't have any hold over me. So ultimately I think it was the fear of death. I had to just let go like, Hey, I'm just going to live my life fully and I'm not going to believe the lie. So if, if, You might not be having a health crisis, but you have some other crisis that makes you feel helpless. I would just encourage you to do what I did and just keep crying out. Go alone. Get away all the time. As any chance you get. 
and just go and praise him and ask him to show himself to you. And feeling his presence is the only thing that's really going to carry you through your time. So that's a good example of God revealing it so he can heal it. And that's why I honestly was never worried for her. I didn't like what she was no, going. No, he wasn't. He wasn't worried at all. And that was the problem. I was like dying. He's like, going to be okay. You're going to be okay. Everything's great. And he's such an optimist that it drives me crazy sometimes. But I love you. I needed that because I want, there were days where I'm like, I want to just cry. I, I don't want to see anybody. I want to be in despair. Like I want to, because it feels good sometimes. And because you're so miserable that I'm just tired of being strong all the time or trying so hard. But he'd be like, nope, you got this. You're going to live and not die. And, and we would talk about all the issues that came up because it's really just stuff for God to deal with. And that's what he did. And that's what every hard season does. It produces life, produces something good if you stay the course in it and not revert back to all of the things we listed. That's so good. So James 4, 5 through 8 says, God resists you, resists you when you're proud, but continually pours out grace when you are humble. So then surrender to God, stand up to the devil and resist him, and he will flee in agony. Move your heart closer and closer to God, and he will come even closer to you. But make sure you cleanse your life, you sinners. <laughs> <laughs> Good job. But it sounds like that, you sinners. <laughs> and keep the, your heart pure and stop doubting, <laughs> you sinners. Those are the people we don't like. No, the other people, not us. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so in this, there's a lot of key points. The not doubting, that's the thing you have to get to when you're in the pit. It's like, no matter what, I'm not going to doubt that you're good. I don't understand what in the world you're doing. Why well, I have no idea why this is happening in my life, but I'm not going to doubt you. You're good no matter what. And then it says so simply, you resist the enemy and he does flee. Like I really did. I, I did the whole thing and I'm not a dramatic person, but that's a like, I'm not a, like, I'm going to cast you out or I'm going to, what is the word y'all always use? Come Besides out. casting. Come out. No, I'm going to do. Get don't. behind me, Satan. <laughs> <laughs> no, I can't think of the name, but y'all are always like, you got to, like, do your own deliverance, basically, and. I'm not really, I'm, not, I'm more like, you know, go, and I don't want to deal with you kind of thing, but <laughs> <laughs> just go away. I don't have time for you today. Um, <laughs> but if you do resist him, and I do remember in that time saying, you have no right. I command, command, that's the word. And I would be like, I command these lungs to breathe. I command you, enemy, to get your hands off of my body. Things like that. And so those are things you have to like, it, it's saying resist him and he will flee. That is resisting. Oh no, you don't have rights over me. You don't have any rights over me. And so it took six months and it really felt like he did have rights over me because I could not breathe still. And I'm like, I have done all the prayers. I have said all the things. I have done all the things. I've depended on the Lord and I'm still struggling. So it's in that place where it's taking way too long that you can easily go into that like, well, I'm just, I don't know if he's good in this area or maybe this is how it's going to stay. But no, you have to keep resisting him and he will flee. You, you, you got this. Uh, this that's you. Let's, you take over. Okay, so we're going to talk just briefly about grace. My favorite definitions of grace is this understanding of influence. I think of grace as influence or the government of grace that governs our life to move in the direction and do the things and go the places and become what God calls us to become. So we're saved by grace through faith. So grace is an empowerment. Grace is God's guidance, his direction, his leading. Um, it's what literally saves us out of every situation. Okay, so the devil tries to influence us into dark places and dark things, dark belief systems, ungodly beliefs, uh, reverting back to our past, hurts, pains, lies. But grace is influencing you the other way all the time. I think of like the Lord's Prayer where it says, 
lead us not into temptation. Well, a better way to say it is lead me away. Is, uh, it, that's the better way to think of that because God doesn't lead you in it. He leads you away from it or out of it, right? So literally grace is what's always saving you. Even if you fall prey to the darkness or lies or belief systems or get angry or unforgiving or succumb to temptation, God's grace is always there to save you. The key is to have faith consistently. You're saved by grace through faith. So your faith is a response to God's grace. It's when you got born again. It's when you said yes to Jesus. It's when you chose to walk in his forgiving love and the blood of Jesus instead of falling prey to lies and condemnation. That's grace to me. And God's always giving you grace. He's so gracious. He's so kind. He's so loving. All of us deserve death, but because of God's grace, he led us out of it and saved us every single time. And so the devil has a false deceptive narrative that makes you think that you're going to be saved, but really it's a trap. The devil or the Lord saves you by grace out of your struggles and your challenges every single time, every time. That's right. (laughs) So grace is activated. I feel like one way I see it is we all have grace. We're all given a measure, a big measure of grace, but most of us don't use it. We don't even acknowledge it. I think there's a part on us that has to, I know there's a part on us that has to say, I am choosing to look for your presence and your empowerment. I need you to carry me through this, Lord. I can't do it in my own strength. And so I think that's why it's so activated when you're the weakest or when you're the most humble is because you're finally realizing you're not in charge, you're not in control, the Lord is, and you want him to lead your life. So we didn't get to this in the first service, but some ways that you can stay out of the pit, out of falling for the uh, imitation light, is to stay connected. A lot of times we isolate. We've got to have community. We have to have accountability. And it's so easy to start being consumed with those voices, the negative voices, when you don't have anyone to counter those voices for you. Like, honestly, he is awesome because there's days where I wake up and in my feelings and everything is not happening the way it should be or I'm struggling. And he's always positive. (laughs) I just want to stress that. And uh, You don't think it's awesome in the no, moment, I though. I don't think it's awesome. It's very annoying at the moment. Because <laughs> she wants to stay in her pity party. No, just for an hour. I mean, can you get... <laughs> I, I don't even want to be in it all day. I just want to be able to say, this really just sucks. Like, I, I'm really struggling. And he's like, well, you know, it's only going to produce this. Or, you know, everything is positive. Positive. <laughs> great. I need you in my life. So we have to have that. And if you don't have that in your marriage, you need to find that in somebody like a peer or somebody in the church. Um, And then one thing I always do, because I get bombarded by lies just like you do. It's a constant thing. I think to myself, when I think a thought that brings like a bad feeling, a negative feeling, a feeling of defeat, I think to myself, is this a life-giving thought? Does this produce life in me? If it doesn't produce life in me, then it's a direct thought from the enemy into your mind. And if we're not better, I know that's been preached a million times, yet we live all day long believing lies. So it can't not be said enough. Like every single thought has to be taken captive. Like stop it and say, and say out loud, that is not truth. And then sometimes when you're not strong enough to combat the lies, you need to go to someone saying, I'm believing this. I I can't get this out of my mind. And they can say, that's not true. Here's the truth. So you've got to be able to judge rightly of what those thoughts are. I'm teaching even Cadence. I posted something a while ago. Cadence was trying to get ready for church. And later on that day, she told me, and (laughs) she told me, um, I think I'm really ugly when I'm getting ready for church. And I think my face looks funny or that people think I will look funny 
I thought. And this woman, she was eight. I was like, you're eight. <laughs> what are you even thinking about your beauty and your face? And where did you get that? And he's... And he starts young. He starts so young. And it doesn't matter that she, she knows the Lord. And she's here worshiping. And she has such a heart for him. And he'll work even more overtime on her. Because she's a leader. And so I say that just to say, he starts early. He's constantly getting you to be focused on yourself for one and to focus on how you don't measure up and how other people will think negatively of you. That would be the main thing that he's going to keep going around and round and round. But the good thing is I, she knew that it was the devil. And just the fact that she knew that it was the devil was huge win for me. She said, the devil's been lying to me. And I said, for an eight-year-old to tell me that she knows the devil's giving her those thoughts, because I told her if it's a bad thought, it's a devil thought. <laughs> I know this is so simple, but it still works for us. If it's a good thought and it makes you happy, it makes you feel good, it feels right in your heart, then it's from God. And he loves you and he only gives you good thoughts. He only has good things to tell you. And we say that all the time. So she came to me, the devil lied to me. He's been lying to me. And so it... We've got to teach our kids that. That was a whole nother rabbit trail. Well, let me say something about okay. that. So I lay both my hands on my kid's head before bed, and I prophesy over them. And I get down real close because there's something about that. If, if you got little kids, this is good for you to grab onto. I get real close to their ears, and I, I whisper in their ears the truth of God. I affirm them. I encourage, I declare who they are. I speak life to them. And then when the lies come, I teach them how to speak life to themselves and to stand against, because all of our kids are going to have to learn on their own how to stand against the lies of the enemy. If you have kids that are struggling with seeing things in the spirit, especially dark demonic things or believing lies, then they have a very real gift to hear and see, even if they're seeing lies. So now teach them where to look for Jesus and where the truth is. Mm -hmm. So every time my daughter tells me a lie, I say, well, what's the truth? What's Jesus really say? You know, and our kids, in the, you know, early on, they'd come and I'm scared in the middle of the night or they had a bad dream or they saw something on the TV, you know, or on a show, some little thing. Like we watched Lion King and they got terrified of the hyenas. Was years ago, yeah. Yeah. And then we watched Soul Surfer the other day and because she had her arm bit off by a shark, they're like, I need to pray before bed because I think I'm going to see that in my dreams. Like, wow. But at least they, they know like, hey, I'm not going to let that And they did pray dreams. and they didn't yeah, have bad dreams. They, yeah. So, I mean, they know. It's funny. They're already able to recognize like this could lead somewhere bad. The best thing you can do is teach your kids how to be discerning mm -hmm. early because they're super gifted. They're not weighed down by all of our religious junk. Right. Right. They're innocent like a child cultivate it. Parents, cultivate your kids. Prophesy. Lay hands on them. I declare my son is a mighty man of God every single night. And he's not all the time. So I, I feel like <laughs> what you need to do is like he's having a rough day. That's the night I'm like, he is a nice he has a kind heart. He is loving and he has not been loving the whole day. So like you just have to say out loud like what you're declaring and it works. And it, I really do see a shift because he's hearing oh I know I've heard no all day or I've gotten in trouble all day but he's hearing oh I know I'm a kind boy you know your kids are going to see a million false lights false religions false belief systems deceptive things of the world the greatest deceptive thing right now is the world it's the spirit of this age so the god of this age there's a god of this age that wants to blind our children. That's why I would never let your little kids ever be on social media, ever. You think they're strong? You don't, there's stuff that comes across those feeds and in my inboxes. There's the devil's always fishing for your kids. He's always fishing. And some of you are letting your kids swim right in the pool. You got to cover them, protect them. And it doesn't mean that you don't teach them and train them how to stand against it. But at seven years old, Eight years old, 10 years old, 13 years old. 13-year-olds are not equipped to handle what's coming out of the spirit of the sage right now. 
Now you teach them, I don't, I don't overly shield my kids. Like my kids know my testimony. They don't know the full detail, but they know dad's oh, been in jail. they learning something new. <laughs> You know, I'm like Dada did. Um, yes, yes, guys. Anyway. <laughs> Anyways, let's finish up. Uh, so there's a lot. I'm going to go fast on this last part. One of the other things I feel like is neglected notoriously in the church world is the fact that your mind, body, and spirit are all connected. And when we're in a pit of despair, and I know this is way too practical for church, but I'm saying working out has been my lifesaver, especially when I couldn't breathe. I forced myself to go walking up and down the road. You have to move your body. Like the, God created your body to create serotonin when you work out, which helps you to think clearly and feel better. And you can get out of that pit a whole lot faster when you're thinking clearly. And he designed your body that way. So we cannot negate the body part. Like we cannot just feed ourselves junk, and never, ever move our bodies, and then wonder why we just feel kind of, hmm, about life. So there's that. Your physical health is so attached to yeah. your emotional well-being, yeah. right? And so the challenge is, is when you're down or you're in darkness or struggling, we don't want to do those things. We don't work out and we eat bad, right? But then you feel worse. Mm -hmm. Now, this isn't a condemnation thing, and I know it's Christmas, no, I mean, yeah, you but, can have times to eat things, but like the other... The, even just a brisk walk, yeah, even going like, around... And last week I was, I told him, I said, I feel like I'm being surrounded by a dark cloud. Like I can't... Oh, she get, was. She had a dark cloud all wow. over her. Her eyes were black. It was luring right over her head. Anyway... I don't even. I don't even know with him sometimes. So, <laughs> but I said to him before, and I told him like, "Man, you had a dark cloud over you." And I said, "I do, and I know I do, and so I know what I need to do." And it's not just praying and worshiping because I had done a plenty of that. I said, "I've got to go to get to the gym in the morning," and he's like, "Go." Get, you know, please, please, for the love, go, go. go. And so, <laughs> and he knows. I go run a couple miles, get it all out, pray to Jesus, listen to worship, or whatever you got to listen to. And then I'm telling you, it's like that. After that, it's like okay, it's gonna be okay. I can clear. I can think clearly. I feel better. I got my energy back. So I don't. I don't know if you want to hear that or not, but I promise you, it works. Okay. And y'all need to take care of yourself. Yeah. Because if you're a part of this church, we don't want to do your funeral prematurely. You only got one you, right? So I really, really go after I'm 51. I got a four, seven, and nine-year-old. I need to run really long, really far with these kids. And I want to make the best of what I have and what God's given me. So I challenge all of you, please take care of yourself. I'm asking you. We watch over your soul and we watch over your life. Take care of yourself. Yeah, and then we all know this, sow to the Spirit, you reap to the Spirit. So garbage in, garbage out. We've got to stay in the Word, worship, all of those things. Um, and pray in and, tongues. And pray in tongues. And so the other thing I feel I've never mentioned, but is something I do consciously is I make an effort to look for beauty. You know that you guys know if you follow me at all on social media, I like taking pretty pictures. I've always loved to look for beauty and that's that's how I do it. I, I love photography because I love to look for how I can see beauty in the world. And a lot of times when you're in a really bad, dark place, you've got to try. It's got to be a conscious effort to see the good in life and to see that there's still beauty around you. So Philippians 4, 8 through 9, we, we know it, but it's the kids memorized it for co-op and I needed to hear them say it to me over and over again. It said, it says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. And so that's, that's the thing. That's looking for beauty, looking for the good, because it's still there. We were just saying, like, even though there's this bad area, I don't know who can raise their hand and say every single area of their life is all good and perfect, but I can't. So we've got to focus on the good parts. And that's, the counterfeit is none of those things deep down. It may look like it for a moment, but it actually doesn't produce pr peace and it doesn't produce life. The counterfeit will often try to appear that way, but behind it is deception. So one of the things I pray a lot is, Lord, help me to see the deception behind the deception, 
right? Because there's so much deception behind deception. Another thing that I've been praying a lot lately is, I think I told you I was at the gym a while back and I said, I was crying out to the Lord and I said, Lord, I wanna see what you see. And God, I heard God instantly say, you can't handle what I see. And I said, you're right. And so I changed my prayer to, God, help me to see what you want me to see. Because maybe there's a lot of things he wants to show you that you're not seeing, but there's also a lot of things he doesn't want to show you that you are seeing. So the prayer is, God, because some of y'all can't handle the deception behind the deception. My kids can't handle it. They don't need to see it. In fact, God protects you and shields you from a lot of deception because it'll make you spin out if you knew what was really going on in the world. And that's why God says, get your eyes on me, not the things of the world. Get your eyes off all the political stuff that's driving you nuts and crazy. It's some, for some of you, it's causing you to spin out. All right, let's close it, close it down. Here we go. You, oh, you want me to do that? Okay. So um, here's what we want to do. I want you to pr- think to yourself, because we're going to pray, and I want you guys to respond to what we've taught today. First off, um, we want to pray for those of you that had, have had their eyes on the imitation light. Okay? Uh, maybe it's been religion. Maybe it's been works of religion. Maybe it's been the things of this world that look good or bewitch or bedazzle you. Maybe it's been legalism. Maybe you've fallen prey to that whole minister of righteousness thing. How do you know if you're constantly feeling condemned? The law sets you free from the sin of, of, Jesus set you free from the law of sin and death, which ultimately condemned you, but you're not now. You're under the blood. I want to pray for those of you that are not born again. If you've not fully surrendered your life, that's, it has to start there. So at some point, stop resisting the Lord. I don't, there, you got no good reason to resist God, none. If, if anything, you're blaming it on your old past and your religious junk from stuff that you experienced in your childhood or whatever you think it is. I love what Mark said today. God's not who you think he is. And I, my first thing came out of my mouth, mouth is he's a thousand times better than what most people think. Um, we want to pray for those of you that have been deceived by false religions. We want to pray for those of you that are weighed down and plagued with religious burdens, inadequacy, shame, not measuring up. Uh, those that are in a dark place right now and need grace to pull you out. It happens. Jesus said in this world, you're going to have trouble, but take heart, I overcame it. Jesus said, come unto me, all you who are weak, weary, and heavy laden. I'm going to hook a yoke up to you and it's going to be easy because you've been plowing ground in your own strength. Now I'm going to plow with you and all you got to do is enjoy the ride. That's the way I see it. Okay, so you got to be honest with yourself. You know, especially the men in here. Come on, men. God's blessed you. You got amazing wives, amazing kids. You got an amazing life. The fact that many of you are even still alive and have what you have is the miracle of God. And we've all taken it for granted. But, you know, the men rising up and being spiritual leaders of their home and covering their wife. I love my wife. And I tried to dwell with her with understanding. I wish she would dwell. He tried to dwell with me. He's not dwelling. I love you. That's a scripture, Amber. Second Peter three. I know, but it sounds funny when husbands you say dwell that. with your wives with understanding. Wow. Yeah, you need to read that a little more. Okay. <laughs> oh gosh, it's got hot. I got hot all of a sudden. I need a lot of prayer. Yes, I do. So, um, you know, I just, I think we just make it so complicated and we make God complicated and we complicate this life and we complicate Christ and we complicate church. We complicate each other. And the truth is it's not that complicated. It's way more simple. And some of you are being eaten up inside your head right now. Mental anguish, fear, torment, lies, confusion. So make the conscious decision to turn your gaze to the truth and to the light. Turn to him. Darkness tries to get us all. And sometimes we give give in to the darkness. But God in his grace always pulls you out. So if you need to be pulled out of it today, that's what we want to pray for. All right? So I'd like to ask you all to stand and my prayer partners to come up to the front.
Prayer partners, team leaders, elders, if you please come up to the front. Now just close your eyes for just a moment. Amber? I thought you had it from here. We're going to pray together. We're going to pray for you guys together, but if you've really struggled with any of the things we've talked about today or you're in a place of struggle, one of the best things you can do is come up and let somebody pray with you. Matthew 18 says that when two come together as to touching anything in his name, they'd have what they agree upon. And sometimes you need somebody else to agree with you, right? Like we're gonna agree corporately. The Holy Spirit can agree with you. But Jesus loves it when we come and we pray together. And so if you're sick, battling addiction, battling fear, religious pride, anger, hatred in your heart, unforgiveness like Amber talked about, whatever it is, if you've been deceived by imitation light, then let somebody pray with you today. So we're going to pray. And as we're praying, you can start making your way up to the front. Go ahead, Amber. Lord, thank you for your presence with us here today. Thank you that you're working on our hearts right now, Lord, and that you are wanting to bring full freedom to each one of us, that we will be able to get out of any pit that we're in, in any area of despair, any darkness that we're in, Lord, that you would show us what it is that we need to bring complete freedom and to get us out of the darkness. Show us your truth in every area of our life. Show us where we may have fallen into the deception. Help us to repent. Help us to, to come to you and to hear your voice this morning so that we can walk out being able to run our race well. In Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for saving, sufficient grace. His grace is sufficient. It lacks nothing. It needs nothing. It's everything. It's fully self-sustainable. God is in need or la- of nothing and lacks nothing. And when his grace comes to you, you will be in need and lacking nothing. You will not be in need or lacking anything. And I thank you so much, Lord God, for your influence upon our heart and our mind to lead us out of the deceptive lies the imitation light. Lord, let us not be bewitched, be bewitched or bewildered by the things of this world or the things that the enemy puts in front of us, but help us, Lord, to trust you in every situation and every circumstance. May we never become full of religious pride, but may we always be humble. And I pray that this would be a church full of humility, love, purity, unity. And I pray that anything that would be dividing us, that you would tear it down with your truth. Lord, I thank you for your healing power. Lord, we stand together for our elder, Doug Feck, and for his healing today. We pray, Lord, that you would wash over him, cleanse him, be with him as he wrestles through this sickness. I thank you that he will live and not die. And I pray that same prayer for any of your loved ones that are battling health issues or sickness, and I speak life and health to them. I come into agreement with you for their healing. Lost loved ones, prodigals, Uh, Those that are in the world, I pray, God, that you would rescue them and save them and pull them up and out of that darkness. Thank you that our children are your children, and thank you that they're full of promise and hope. And I prophesy to all the children of this church that they are young men and women of God, full of the Spirit, full of power, full of giftings, full of hope, and that the devil will not scoop up our kids and pull them into the darkness and the things of this world. Thank you so much, Lord God, for strong marriages. I pray for all the men in this sanctuary today, that they would be uh, strong spiritual leaders that cover and love and protect and honor their wives and their family, that they would be point men that intercede and pray over their home, especially at night while their family sleeps. God, I thank you, Jesus, for the way you care, the way you love, and I thank you so much for this church, Lord. And I pray that as people come for prayer, that healing would take place, and we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.